Let me take a moment to acknowledge some of our distinguished guests. United States Representative, the Honorable Brett Guthrie. Former Undersecretary of the Army, the Honorable Joe Reeder. Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army, Equity and Inclusion Agency, Mr. Anselm Beach. Commanding General, U.S. Army Forces Command, General Michael Garrett. General Scott Miller and the chairman of the West Point Association of Graduates, Lieutenant General Retired Joe DeFrancisco. But, <laughs> before, before proceeding, we must address some safety protocols as we continue to navigate the challenges of the pandemic. The West Point community is a highly vaccinated population, but the academy does not does host visitors from various locations. For everyone's safety, please follow these basic guidelines. When indoors, masks are required for all individuals. When outdoors, masks are required for all non-vaccinated personnel. We appreciate your cooperation. Thank you. Today's official party consists of the 60th Superintendent of the United States Military Academy, Lieutenant General Daryl A. Williams, West Point Class of 1983. And today's keynote speaker, General Retired Vincent K. Brooks, West Point Class of 1980. Please rise for the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, performed by the West Point Band, and remain standing for the invocation by Father Matt. Please join in singing. Everyone, please join in singing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see In 1888, Colonel Benjamin Grierson, 1st Commander of the 10th Cavalry Regiment, declared for his men and for all the Buffalo Soldiers, I believe, the officers and enlisted men have cheerfully endured many hardships and privations, and in the midst of great dangers, steadfastly maintained a most gallant and zealous devotion to duty and they may well be proud of the record made and rest assured that the hard work undergone in the accomplishments of such important and valuable service to their country is well understood and appreciated and that it cannot fail sooner or later to meet with due recognition and reward. Well, we give you thanks, Almighty God, for bringing us to this happy day of recognition and reward. It is a day of justice. It is not the day of justice, when at the end, you will give justice to Henry O. Flipper, John Alexander, Charles Young, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., and many others who deserve your justice, Lord. But. We know that this day would come because you promised, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in that kingdom, the blessed shall see heaven opened, and behold, one seated on a horse, one called righteous and true, and the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, will follow him on horses, singing, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Once again, welcome to today's dedication ceremony and a very special welcome to the members of the various Buffalo Soldier Societies present at this event. It is a tremendous privilege for all of us to, to participate in this ceremony where we honor the legacy and service of the Buffalo Soldiers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the United States Military Academy Superintendent, Lieutenant General Darrell A. Williams. All right, how's everybody doing today? All right, distinguished guests, welcome to West Point and the United States Military Academy. And thank you for all being here to honor the service and legacy of the Buffalo Soldiers. There are a few special guests here that I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank. First, I know you're watching out there, sir. Major General Retired Fred Gordon, West Point Class of 62. Sixty-first Commandant of the Corps of Cadets here, who unfortunately cannot be with us here today, but is watching via live stream. General Gordon has been one of the driving forces behind this project, serving as committee chair with the Buffalo Soldiers Association. We all truly appreciate your leadership and passion in getting this project into the end zone. To Dr. Andrew Matthews and the Buffalo Soldiers Association of West Point, how about a round of applause for her? Thank you for your ongoing support and work to honor, promote, and preserve the history and contributions to the Buffalo Soldiers. Mr. Eddie Dixon, where are you, sir? Stand and be recognized. <laughs> Mr. Dixon is the sculptor of this incredible work you're about to see. Eddie has been the master. Yeah, let's go, let's go. Please stand. There you go. There are also two incredible people I'd like for us to remember. Sanders and Cora Matthews. Dr. Matthews' grandparents, Sander is one of the last of the Buffalo Soldiers assigned here, and both he and his wife, Cora, were an integral part of the Academy and West Point, as well as the extended Hudson Valley community. Throughout their lives, both were dedicated to sharing the story of the Buffalo Soldiers, educating future generations on their contributions to our great history here at West Point. That legacy still inspires us today, and it paved the way for many who would become some of our army and nation's leaders of distinction, some of whom are gathered here today, as well as those whose history has yet to be written. It was Sanders' likeness that served as the model for the statue that we will dedicate here today. There you go. I'd like to also point out that today, would have been Cora's 102nd birthday. I can't think of a more appropriate birthday present for her. I had the honor and privilege of talking to her many times. Which 
It is now my uh, great pleasure to introduce General Brooks, class of 1980. Uh, you all know him as a great friend. I know him as someone that I used to look up to when I was out there on the plane as a, as a new cadet out at West Point. I think he hazed me a few times. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, General Brooks has commanded at all levels in our great army, finishing up in Korea. And I know him as a mentor, as a great general, and as a personal friend. General Brooks, Vincent Brooks, class of 1980. Sir, the floor is yours. Well, I appreciate the introduction from our superintendent, Lieutenant General Williams. And, uh, you know, he, he may have been at the other end of the plane once upon a time, but today the plane is his and I'm standing at attention for you, sir. <laughs> Uh, what an honor it is to, uh, to, to speak at this ceremony. I thank you for inviting me to do so. And Chaplain, thanks so much for that invocation. Powerful. Awesome. And, of course, I, I just want to, actually, before I begin, I'm going to break protocol a little bit. Cadet Commander, would you please, please give the cadets rest? Thank you, sir. All right. I never did that as the first captain. I'm just making up for lost time. <laughs> uh, I certainly want to begin by acknowledging all the distinguished guests who are here today. They've already been named, and so I won't go through that again, but uh, everyone here is distinguished. And it's uh, such an honor to see a tremendous gathering like this for such a special occasion. I'm just so, so honored and proud and humbled uh, to be here with you to do this. I'm filled with excitement and emotion. The first that comes from just following Daryl Williams. You know, he's always got excitement, passion, and emotion, and it's contagious. But I'm filled with a, a different kind of sentiments today. I, I uh, find myself a bit hard pressed, honestly, to share some thoughts that will be meaningful for such an event as this, and yet brief enough for us to get to the unveiling as we are really gathered here to witness and observe and to hear the cadet gospel choir sing once again, and for all of us to sing some of these great songs, the alma mater and the army song together in unison, just as we sang the national anthem together. And that's a beautiful way to do it. I uh, hope that you'll bear with me for just a few minutes. I won't take long. I just want to tell you what was on my mind as I was capturing my thoughts. At first I thought of the, the panoply of African-American luminaries, both individuals and units, who served in the armed forces of the United States from before the founding of the Republic up to this very day, and that their reach is expansive, and it's a part of every chapter of American history. I think of the sharpshooters on Breed's Hill and Bunker Hill in Boston during the Revolutionary War, the sailors in the Battle of Lake Erie in the War of 1812, the 1st South Carolina Volunteer Infantry, later redesignated 33rd U.S. Colored Troops Regiment, and the 54th Massachusetts Regiment fighting for the Union in the Civil War. I think of the Tuskegee Airmen, the Montford Point Marines, the 6th Triple Eight Central Postal Directory Battalion, the 761st Tank Battalion Black Panthers, the Triple Nickel 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion, among others. These are all contributions made by African American warriors and patriots to serve this nation for so long. But among them, among them, none shine brighter or more enduringly in their impact than the collection of warriors known as the Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know the basic history. 1866 order to create four regular army regiments, two of cavalry, two of infantry, and all comprised of black soldiers led by white officers and later both white and black officers, many of them historic figures produced by West Point. The order gave birth to the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments, U.S., and to the 24th and 25th 
Infantry Regiments, U.S. You've heard of their service during the period of Reconstruction, serving in former Confederate states, followed by their postings to the American Western and Southwestern frontiers, where they gallantly fought against Indian tribes, who gave them their names, Buffalo Soldiers, and concurrently against Mexican raiders and lawless frontiersmen. The Buffalo Soldiers secured the westward expansion all the way to the Pacific Ocean and into Alaska. No longer limited by continental borders, they were among the expeditionary deployments to Cuba and to the Philippines during the war with Spain and the Philippine War. And again, during the punitive expedition with Mexico, once again distinguishing themselves each time as gallant and heroic warriors. The reach of the four original regiments expanded into other all-black units, volunteers and regulars, like the Blue Helmets, pushing forward from the French lines in World War I. The breakers of the Gothic line in Italy, the securers of the Philippine archipelago, all in World War II. The warrior spirit and the legacy of the Buffalo Soldier were there in each one of those places. Here at West Point, the all-white U.S. Military Academy Cavalry Detachment was less than stellar until 1907 with the assignment of the Buffalo Soldiers of the 9th Cavalry. And they were given the mission of maintaining the horses at West Point and providing horsemanship and, and equitation instruction to the Corps of Cadets. And they more than rose to the occasion. A request for the assignment of black troopers had been put forth by the West Point superintendent and other West Point leaders since 1897. And perhaps those senior officers had seen the Buffalo Soldiers in action and knew of their skills and discipline. But by 1906, the situation became intolerable as desertions soared and reenlistments plummeted. We all know that that means that morale was bad. And this was within that detachment provided by the 15th Cavalry, U.S. Why? It, well, it was a relentless workload. They were under strength. They had missions all over the installation and they were getting burned out. The superintendent communicated that despite untiring efforts to improve the condition of the unit, there was a great lack of the proper military spirit and deportment. So one of General Williams' predecessors, then Colonel Hugh L. Scott, superintendent at the time, and a future chief of staff of the United States Army, along with the commandant, General Mark Quander's predecessor, Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Howes, later Major General Robert Howes, sent urgent telegrams to the War Department requesting the assignment of Buffalo Soldiers. In 1907, the Adjutant General at the War Department favorably responded, and the 9th U.S. Cavalry received orders to fill the detachment at West Point, beginning in their new mission in March of 1907. The improvement was immediate as the black troops performed all of their assigned duties and added to them the grooming of officers' mounts and teaching officers, their families, and even the girlfriends of cadets, according to Sanders Matthews, <laughs> how to ride. The superintendent reported back to the War Department that same year that the Quote, the men are better satisfied. The equipments and horses are in better condition than when the detachment was composed of white men. And no desertions have occurred. No desertions have occurred among the colored men compared with the 13 desertions among the white men in the seven months immediately preceding the unit change. This high example of professionalism and esprit remained the hallmark of the 9th U.S. Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers, those troopers who had the mission from 1907 to 1932. And this tradition continued 
after their redesignation to the 10th U.S. Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers who took the mission from 1932 to 1947. Just think about the cadets and the officers who touched the professionals over these four decades of their mission here. Names like George Patton, Dwight Eisenhower, Omar Bradley, James Van Fleet, Leslie Groves, Maxwell Taylor, Matthew Ridgway, James Gavin, Creighton Abrams, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., the son of a Buffalo soldier, William Westmoreland, and even two Heisman Trophy winners, Felix Doc Blanchard and Glenn Davis, beat Navy. <laughs> the battles fought by the Buffalo Soldiers from 1866 to 1947 were many, and their accomplishments were storied. All the while, one particular battle went with them no matter what the location was. The battle against institutional racism. And there can be no doubt that the Buffalo Soldiers carried an extra burden. Neither can there be any doubt that the Buffalo Soldiers created an impact domestically and internationally that far exceeded their military contributions. It was here at West Point that black soldiers were first allowed to have families and government furnished housing on post, integrated with the families of white enlisted men, unprecedented. It was here at West Point that the first government sponsored public school for children of soldiers and officers was opened. And it included the children of Buffalo soldiers. And I would add that the city of Highland Falls also deserves great credit with integrated schools that included the children of Buffalo soldiers, some of whom would become Buffalo soldiers themselves, like Robert P. Johnson, decades before the historic Brown versus the Board of Education case changed the landscape of education in America. And even while harsh disciplinary treatment, harassment and racism was ongoing in the cadet barracks. At the very same time, ladies and gentlemen, we gather here on this field. There was once a dusty and rocky plain to commemorate the Buffalo Soldiers as a collective and more importantly, and more particularly, the Buffalo Soldiers who served right here at West Point on this field that since 1973, has been known as Buffalo Soldier Field. And in these buildings behind us, there were barracks and stables and administrative buildings that supported them during their time and their mounts. Here on this field, we can feel them. We can feel them. We can sense their stoic discipline in the heat of the West Point summer in the gloom of the West Point winter, we can imagine their impressive and impeccable uniforms and their equipment mounted atop perky-eared horses and sturdy army mules. We can draw inspiration from them now and we will for generations to come. As we dedicate this monument, let us be reminded of the noble service and the sacrifices that contributed so immeasurably to the history of West Point and our nation. And let us ever be reminded as we marvel at its beauty and the strength that it portrays that once upon a time, there really were giants that roamed the plain, the cavalry plain, now known as Buffalo Soldier Field. And this is what they looked like. I'm proud today to Thank you. I'm, I'm so proud today to be a West Point graduate, and I'm proud to be a Buffalo soldier impacted by the legacy of those Buffalo soldiers of the past. Thank you, Buffalo soldiers of West Point, for setting a shining example of professionalism and determination. Thank you, Buffalo Soldiers Association of West Point and troopers like Robert P. Johnson, a third-generation Buffalo soldier born here 
and Sanders Maddie Matthews Sr. They and so many others continue to serve both West Point and the community, like, like Sanders Matthews as a police officer in Highland Falls, a bus driver on post, well after his military service had ended. Thank you to them for telling their stories and keeping the memory alive for 60 years of reunions. Thank you, Major General Retired Fred Gordon and the committee for your persistence in converting this rock. And thank you, Eddie Dixon, for another, another beautiful monument. And thank you, Superintendents Caslin and Williams and your staffs for having the vision and the courage to make today and this monument possible. And finally, thank you all for your presence today to bear witness to this dedication. God bless you all. God bless our academy and God bless our nation. Thank you very much. Got to lower the mic a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for those inspiring words. Now it's the time we've all been waiting for. At this time, we will witness the unveiling of the monument. Will the following individuals please come forward for the unveiling and for the laying of the wreath immediately following? The United States Military Academy Superintendent, Lieutenant General Daryl A. Williams. United States Military Academy Command Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major Michael J. Coffey. Today's guest speaker, General Retired Vincent K. Brooks. Lieutenant Colonel Retired Norman Beatty from First Hope Bank. Dr. Lawrence Hughes, Vice President of Operations for 7-Eleven. Major Retired Joseph Lunsford. Mr. Jim Veter, CEO of U.S. Electrodynamics Incorporated. Mr. Richard Gardner, Chairman, Northeast Frontier of the National Association of Buffalo Soldiers and Troopers Motorcycle Club. I had to practice that one. <laughs> Dr. Andre Andrea Matthews, President of the Buffalo Soldiers Association of West Point. <laughs> Cadet Holland Pratt, Brigadier Commander and First Captain. And Cadet Richard Russell, Brigade Command Sergeant Major. Those of you in the back, if you're behind the tent, you can move to the sides if you want to try to get a better view. Private First Class John of the Honor Guard will now lay a wreath. rise as the West Point Glee Club will now perform the alma mater as a tribute in honor of the Buffalo Soldiers.
Please remain standing and join the West Point Cadet Glee Club and the West Point Band in the singing of the Army song. The lyrics can be found in the back of your program. Thank you once again to everyone for coming out to celebrate the unveiling of this spectacular monument and tribute to the Buffalo Soldiers. This concludes today's event. Take care, have a great day, and go Army, beat Navy.